In November 2011, Latoya Emmons, along with her mother and three kids, moved into their new house at 3860 Carolina Street in Gary, Indiana. What happened to them is almost unbelievable. Most people didn't believe them until they witnessed it with their own eyes. What this family experienced was horror that was so bad, a documentary and movie was made about it. This is the true story behind the movie, The Deliverance. In November 2011, Latoya Emmons and her mother and her three children, then ages 7, 9, and 12, moved into a house located at 3860 Carolina Street. Days after the family moved in, they claimed black flies swarmed the porch in December and kept returning even though the family believed they were killed. After moving in, Rosa Campbell, who's the grandmother, initially heard footsteps in the basement and doors creaking. Usually after midnight, Campbell and Ammons both said they occasionally heard the steady clump of footsteps climbing the basement stairs and the creak of the door opening between the basement and the kitchen, but no one was there. Even after they would lock the door, the noise continued. Later she alleged to have witnessed a shadowy figure of a man pacing in the living room and found a boot print. Campbell claimed that she was choked by an unknown force. Emmons' 12-year-old daughter claimed to have levitated above her bed during a sleepover with a friend. It was about 2 a.m. Normally, Campbell, Emmons, and her children would have been asleep, but they were mourning the death of a loved one with a group of friends. Emmons, who was in Campbell's bedroom at the time, startled everyone by screaming. Campbell says she ran into her bedroom where her then 12-year-old granddaughter and her friend were staying. Both the mother and the grandmother said the 12-year-old was levitating above the bed, but she was unconscious. According to their account of events, Emmons and several others surrounded the girl praying. The grandmother said she remembers being terrified. Eventually, Campbell said her granddaughter fell onto the bed after they engaged in prayer. The daughter had no memory of the incident. The older son was allegedly thrown across the room by an unknown force. The younger son allegedly had his eyes roll into the back of his head and was growling, saying, it's time to die and I'll kill you. The family reached out to their doctor, Jeffrey Anuku, on April 19, 2012, when he visited the house during a supposed hunting. He noted that their behavior was delusional. Someone from his office contacted the police. After the police arrived, the children were taken to the hospital. The older boy was described as acting rationally while the younger boy screamed and thrashed. The mother and grandmother said that they didn't know exactly what it was, but they believed it was something supernatural. They called local churches, but most refused to listen. Eventually, after listening to Campbell and Ammons talk about the house and visiting it, officials at one church told them that the Carolina Street house had spirits in it. They recommended that the family clean the home with bleach and ammonia then use oil to draw crosses on every door and window. At the church's suggestion, Emmon said that she poured olive oil on her three children's hands and feet and smeared oil in the shape of crosses on their foreheads. Campbell and Emmons also reached out to two clairvoyants who said that the family's home was haunted by more than 200 demons. Their explanation made sense to Campbell and Emmons. They say because it meshed with their Christian faith. They were told to move out of the house, but that wasn't even an option. Being that they couldn't move away from the house, they made an altar in the basement. Emmons says she and another person donned white t-shirts and white scarves around their heads. Also on the clairvoyant's advice, they burned sage and sulfur throughout the house, starting upstairs and working their way down. The smoke was so thick that they could hardly breathe. Emmons drew a cross with the smoke. The person she was with read Psalms 91 aloud as they moved around the house. The grandmother mentioned that the seven-year-old once flew out of a bathroom like he'd been thrown out of the room. The 12-year-old daughter mentions that she has been held down and choked but nothing was there. Some nights were so bad that the family had to sleep at a hotel. Finally, in desperation, they went to their physician. Evan said that she told him what was going on and hoping that he might understand. 
Campbell said grandson cursed at the doctor in a demonic voice, raging at him. Medical staff said the youngest boy was lifted and thrown into the wall without anyone touching him. The boys abruptly passed out and wouldn't wake up. The grandma cradled one boy in her arms while their mother held the other. Someone from the doctor's office called 911 and said seven or eight police officers and multiple ambulances showed up, but no one knew what was going on. The Department of Child Services, DCS, was alerted. DCS believed that the children were performing for their mother. Stories were published in outlets such as New York Daily News reported that DCS personnel had allegedly witnessed the youngest boy walking up the wall backwards. Later, police asked whether the boy had run up the wall as though performing an acrobatic trick. Everyone that witnessed it said that the boy glided backward on the floor, wall, and ceiling, according to their police report. He then smacked his grandmother. 37-year police captain Charles Austin believed paranormal activity occurred in the house. There was a photo published by the Indianapolis Star claimed to show a shadowy figure when no one was at home. The family hired father Michael Maginot to perform the exorcism. He interviewed the family on April 22, 2012 and concluded that they were being tormented by demons. He told the mother to look up the names of the demons that they came up with so he could use the names in the exorcisms because names have meanings. He eventually performed three exorcisms, two in English and one in Latin, and one exorcism was performed on Latoya Emmons herself. Eventually, the Emmons family moved to Indianapolis in mid-2012, and after that, the event stopped. A few years later, the house was purchased in order to make a documentary. But in the middle of production, a series of unfortunate events happened to the creator of the documentary and his crew. After the completion of the documentary, he had the house demolished. Since then, he hasn't had anything happen to him in relation to the house, nor did the Ammons family. This is the true story behind the movie, The Deliverance. One time, uh, they uh, she woke up in the middle of the night, maybe like three in the morning, and um, they saw this shadowy figure pacing back and forth in the living room. And I saw one like coming into full image. It was coming out of my closet. I've never seen it like that before. I would see the shadows, you know, but I've never seen it like how I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. You can see it stretching his stomach. And, and my grandson was crying, oh, oh, mom, grandma, help, help. And then we go to his leg, and his leg was bulging. I'm like, oh my God, Toya, look. It was bulging out of his arm. And then we pray over and pray over and pray over and pray over and we know them, we know them. Latoya took me inside the house and showed me different stuff. I didn't see anything that was relevant to what she said, even though other people did. So I was very skeptical. I just figured she owed me money and this is a fabricated story. And that's not strange to my walk of life. That does happen, you know. Like I said, if I'd heard it all, this is a new, <laughs> new one to me. And I'm told my daughter said, they're gonna make it look like we are hurting each other. 
So we're going to have to get some help some kind of place, some kind of way. we got to convince somebody that this is actually going on. This boy was um, in one of the um, emergency room areas. He was kind of growling, you know, and, and his grandmother was uh, holding his hands and, and trying to coax him back. And all of a sudden he started, you know, she was kind of backing him up and toward the wall. And then he started to walk up the wall backwards, did a flip over her head. And, uh, and and there was the psychologist and the social ser uh, service worker in that room that saw that and they ran out and got the uh, um, security and the security called the chaplain and you know he called me and they got the police involved and all that. Until he saw what the other one did when he went up that wall. Then he like, oh my God, this is impossible. Nobody can do this, nobody. There's five people that saw this happen, and they're, you know, different walks of life. That, that does change things a little bit. I have, I have a hard to believe that all five of those people will say this just to be saying it. It was pretty much without incident until we get to the part of your name, and you ask for its name. Now, so far, she's always been silent. So, and I says, is your name whatever? And then all of a sudden, she started convulsing and such. So. So now once you have a name, you kind of attack it. You try everything, you know, you kind of go through the whole ride to see which things push the buttons of, you know, um, the, the entity. And once you found what does it, you keep on using it over and over. Whenever you would praise God in Latin, no reaction. But you start condemning the demon, you know, condemning, you know, the, the evil spirit, you know, all of a sudden she's reacting to that. And then you will go back, and the moment you go back to praising God, she would stop reacting. So I went through the whole rite, and then finally went the second time, you know, and then it was just like, just focusing on the condemnations part. And that was kind of riling up. I think I even went a third time. But you could tell it was kind of weakening, and then eventually she fell asleep again. Demons can actually possess you, use you. So you can give them the souls, you know, and they make you take your own life, you know. So, I mean, it's real. And a lot of people don't think about it. They live their lives day to day, and you never Light think that it would be you. Yeah, and the flicker and buzz, and, you know. And, you know, so, and they were point, pointing out that's one of the things that happens, electronical, you know, yeah. in interference. And so they, so I went over there and looked at, you know, went to look at it, and then stopped. You know, so I came back and then, okay, tell me about the boyfriend. Then it started again. And then I went back again and it stopped, you know. Then at this time I came back and says, I guess it's afraid of me. And then it's, it started you yeah. know, again. But this time when it stopped, you know. So I even went, got my crucifix, put it on it. It, it was defiant. It was still buzzing and everything. Huh. And so I just kind of let it, let it go. And, and but I wanted to get, you know, what, what's with the boyfriend? Then they started to point to, um, uh, in, in the uh, kitchen, um, they had Venetian blinds all through all the windows, and so the little rod windows, and so the little rod that you turn to open and close it was swinging back and forth. Oh. And so, and they said that's how they would swing back and forth in unison, you know, the whole house would kind of, on each of those. And so I went to look at that, and then I saw the furnace kick on, and and they had tags at the bottom of the three little strings that you know opened the venetian sure. blinds and they were fluttering and the and the st stick was going back and forth and then the the uh, furnace kicked off so that stopped but the thing was still uh, going back and forth then i saw it doing the same thing in unison with the next window the next window the next sure. window so i went to all the windows and they're all going back and forth until so i got to uh, uh, latoya's room and then there was, it looked like something was dripping down her blinds, you know. And I don't remember seeing that. And I go, oh, what, what was, th what's this? And she goes, well, she said she put oil on her blinds in the sign of the cross. But this seemed to be just one vertical line and was dripping. And then I was feeling it and it was oil, you know. And so, oh, and I said, I don't remember seeing that, you know, before. And so, and so um, and then I was still trying to get back uh, 
to seeing okay about the boyfriend and then she points down and there's footprints wet footprints oh this is helping you adjust your mic there uh father there you go perfect okay yep and uh and and so i went to look at them and they were just around her and they're wet and you know i, I could kind of smear smear them but they didn't seem to go anywhere because I, I was in the bathroom i was in the kitchen i also came outside and i don't know if it was raining or whatever but there was no none of my footprints were going yeah there they were just there you know and you know so and I don't remember seeing those before either. So I'm writing all this down. But I still, I'm trying to get to the boyfriend. You know, right. And it's trying not to give me get that direction. And then all of a sudden, she starts shivering. You know, no, no. It, yes, she starts shivering. And then she goes into her bedroom to get a blanket to put around her. Then all of a sudden, she throws the blanket off and and says she's burning up. You know. And I'm still trying to. You know, can, can you tell me about the boyfriend? <laughs> what are you to and, get and, you know, and then she's then she's sick. She has a headache. And you know, I said, okay, it's okay. And it's getting. It's about 10:30 at night. You know, so I, that's about after four hours. And I said, it's not gonna. <laughs> it's not gonna let me do this. So and I didn't want to go beyond midnight or anything there. Sure. So so I, I kind of saw. Okay, I saw enough. And so we kind of closed up, but we're going to continue the rest of the interview by phone. I wanted to hear about